for Europe, for example, and we also don't expect a significant downturn unless the gas supplies really get cut off. We certainly see peak inflation coming sometime in the second half. Uh, we're not there yet. The trigger for the financial distress is going to be a recession, and recession is not mild shallow, but it's going to be severe and protracted. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition with Francine Lacqua. Good morning and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards, in for Francine Lacroix here in London. Here's what's coming up on today's programme. Outflows mount. UBS shares sink in early trade after reporting weaker than expected profit as the global sell-off sees investors pull money. Price bump. Unilever sees a second quarter beat but forecasts a, quote, unprecedented inflation surge and plans to raise prices. Shares start the day higher. And energy standoff. Russia's Gazprom curbs gas flows through Nord Stream as the EU draws up plans to reduce consumption. Welcome to the programme, everybody. Uh, it is uh, just, well, it's just gone 9 o'clock here in London, just gone 10 o'clock if you're in Paris or Berlin. First, let's get to the markets. And European equity markets looking fairly flat this morning. The Stocks Europe 600 not going anywhere in a hurry uh, as a result of, uh, as, as a result of well, nervousness around a few factors. There's the gas question around Europe. There's the inflation story to monitor. There's corporate earnings coming, flooding in, of course. And there's a Fed meeting looming large on the agenda, so we'll focus in on that. We have the US dollar fairly flat. Tech stocks performing fairly flat. Bitcoin, for what it's worth, down 5% today. Uh, so that's what we see on European, uh, a host of European assets, if you like. Let's uh, show you what's going on on uh, the map and where we are across the European picture right now. As I mentioned, the stock 600 is pretty flat. Uh, the FTSE 100 actually making some gains up by half a percent, outstripping uh, gains that we're seeing elsewhere. So we're up by half a percent on the FTSE 100. Of course, when we look at the sector picture, you'll see that we are... Uh, You'll see why that is, because, of course, we've got strong performance coming through for energy names and basic resources and all that uh, plays well for what we're seeing on the FTSE 100. Uh, the Cat is down a tenth of a percent. The Zetradax is down half a percent. The Ibex down half a percent. And the FTSE MIB uh, down by half a percent. So there's plenty, uh, plenty of movement, but in two different directions, which keeps the stock 600 fairly flat this hour. Let me dive into what's going on from a sector perspective. If we look at the uh, GRR function on the Bloomberg, we've got energy stocks actually doing quite well which is what I was mentioning in terms, of the, uh, in terms of the FTSE 100. So energy stocks are doing well. Mining stocks are doing well. That is lifting the FTSE. Uh, sectors that are performing badly, we've got retail stocks moving lower. And interesting that this is a read-through from the Walmart numbers, perhaps, uh, where they definitely put a focus on consumers uh, having to trade down, having to tighten the purse strings as prices are on the rise. So you see retail is the worst-performing sector here in Europe, down by 2.4%. And we just had a headline that suggests that Walmart shares in pre-market in the US are falling 9.5% after they cut their profit guidance. So we'll keep an eye as we get towards the US Open on that. Financial services is also an area of weakness, and this in connection with what's going on at UBS, of course. So UBS uh, is under pressure as a, result, um, as a result of the earnings report we got from UBS. Let us linger on that theme, I think, for a moment. UBS second quarter earnings are in. The Swiss bank reported net income for the second quarter that missed the average analyst's estimate. We sat down with the UBS CEO, Ralph Hamers. Take a listen. What bothers all of us is that it's so unclear as to what is happening. So the next two months will continue a bit of unclarity here. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the central banks are not very clear either. They're very hawkish. So they're really looking at the inflation numbers and reacting to those. Um, in our view, uh, our base case does not uh, uh, expect a significant downturn in the U.S. But for Europe, for example, um, we also don't expect a significant downturn unless the gas supplies really get cut off. Now we do is that your number one concern? I mean, today, Nord Stream again, the, the flow is down. Is that your top concern for Europe? So the top concern for Europe is indeed uh, cutting off completely from the gas supplies uh, for a couple of reasons. First, it will increase gas prices. Secondly, it will render a couple of industries as very um, in inefficient, right? So they can't work at peak capacity, also increasing prices. Um, and with that, you know, um, generating uh, further uh, inflation, uh, making inflation stubborn, uh, which is the real danger, right? That inflation is here to stay. Uh, and uh, so that's the real risk. Is that inflation coming through with requests for pay rises? 
Um, in some cases, we have seen those already, right? And not only for uh, because of inflation, also because in some businesses there is still quite some tension in the labor markets. Mm -hmm. So that has not gone completely away yet. So it's a mix of inflation and, uh, and the labor market circumstances. Um, but, you know, if, if, if inflation continues to be here, of course, it will be reflected also in pay. You talk about the hawkish mode of the central banks. Rates regime is shifting from the ECB. Uh, next up is SMB. When we caught up, you said, man, it's a billion dollars. That's what this rate regime ch change will be. Do you materially uplift that number from whence we last spoke? No, so the $1 billion that we indicated last time was uh, as, uh, at the balance sheet that we had at the end of the first quarter, mm -hmm. uh, at the then uh, going forward rates. At this moment, uh, we see about 400 million of that already in our P&L, uh, and we, are, we, we, we still uh, think that that scenario holds. That was Bloomberg's Manus Granny speaking to the UBS CEO, Ralph Harmers, in Zurich. And as I mentioned, one of the movers in focus today is definitely the UBS share price. It is currently down by 6.5%. Some of the headlines then, you heard them discussing them there. Uh, the, miss, the miss on profit, of course, uh, the, the big one. Lower revenues at wealth management, outflows in the US, investment banking coming in at worse than estimates. Trading in equities was up by 4% against the US comparison of being up by 8%. So that's uh, obviously a, a focus for investors. That's what we have on UBS. Also in focus, we have Unilever and EasyJet. These two stocks are also on the move. Unilever's share price is up by 2.6% this hour. Lots of numbers actually coming in better than expected. So that's the UBS share price. Just to recap on that, up, down by 6.6%. Unilever, lots of numbers coming in better than expected. Volume was light, but prices moving, uh, were able to go up more than estimated. So sales guidance has been increased and there's no worse news on materials. And so that's a focus. EasyJet also in focus then. They put a cost on the disruption. If they hadn't had to take that charge for the cost of disruption, they would have made a profit uh, in, the last, uh, in the last quarter, but they didn't. They made a loss. Revenue did come in better than estimated. So that's where we are on some of the big movers this morning. Coming up, we'll have a discussion on the markets. We'll discuss the earnings stories so far, those still to come, and we'll look ahead to the Fed. This is Bloomberg. The ECB is ready to do whatever it takes to preserve the euro. I have actually committed to staff not to say the famous three words. ECB presidents then and now. Today marks the 10-year anniversary of Mario Draghi's iconic speech, credited, of course, with saving the euro. The central bank now once again faces widening spreads and economic pessimism across the bloc. Less frequently remembered is what Draghi said immediately after those famous three words, believe me, it will be enough. I'm sure uh, Christine Lagarde hopes so too. The question today, can the ECB pack the same punch. We're also watching out for a Fed decision this week that's leading to caution in the markets. Morgan Stanley sees more choppiness and further declines in the market before the year end. I'm pleased to say we're joined now by Diana Amoa, CIO at Kirkus World Asset Management, uh, on set with me here in London. Diana, very nice to see you. So I'm interested in this line from Morgan Stanley. They're saying the, um, the stock rally is another false dawn. Uh, and we have seen a bit of a rally during the month of July, certainly during the, the last week. What's your take on this? sudden strength we seem to have discovered yeah so this is typical summer markets where coming into july you had a lot of indicators showing that the market positioning had become extremely bearish both in equities and in fixed income and that pretty much the extreme in bearish bearishness actually marked the lows from asset price perspective because investors are now winding down given illiquidity in the summer markets we saw short covering both in equities uh, but also in the credit space so it's not uh, surprising that the hedges are the things that have actually been performing very well so cds has outperformed cash bonds in credit uh, we've seen u.s equities actually rebounding some of the more beaten up sectors are mm -hmm. uh, bouncing back so i'd say there's an element of markets just covering shorts that they'd held and had worked well in the first half of the year but then also I think there is, um, and this is where I tend to agree with the Morgan Stanley team, there is a perception by markets that 
if growth is bad enough, it'll cause the Fed to pivot. Yes. That's not really where we are this time round. This time round, the Fed is hyper-focused on inflation mm. because inflation also does feedback to growth. Are we there, but just not yet? I mean, you say we're not there this time around because they are hyper-focused on inflation, and that's a message we always hear very clearly. I suppose, I, to, to echo what Morgan Stanley is saying, those arguments about, you know, there will be a pivot and they will cut rates at some point, they say directionally that is true, but in terms of timing, it's just not happening yet. It's not happening yet, and that's simply because inflation is not showing signs of having peaked yet. The last print we, sh we saw was actually showing a broadening out in inflationary pressures. And that's what the Fed is hyper-focused on right now. So we are not close to the Fed pivoting. And that's perhaps where markets might get caught out if they're starting to trade a pivot from the Fed because it's just too soon. Mm, it's too soon. So, so when does the, the Fed start to cut? Because, uh, you know, there are a lot of people pricing in cuts from next year. And, if, if, and, and link, to, link for me how risk assets perform and our expectations for cuts because obviously equity markets like to look forward, don't they, and, uh, and discount what's going to happen in the future. But what is the link between those things happening? What do, what, what do risk assets do now when we start to get a handle on when the Fed is going to cut? Well, the, the, I'd say the support for risk assets is positioning is much cleaner. So we're not coming into this... Uh, you know, concerns on growth with a market that's overweight equities or for that matter fixed income. Um, the Fed is not going to pivot until they're clear that they've seen inflation actually meaningfully start to decline. And a couple of meetings ago, uh, Chair Powell said that meant they needed to see two or three prints that actually support the view that inflation has peaked and is coming down. We haven't even seen one print yet that's showing that. So we're still a while away from the Fed pivoting. Mm. Do you think that certain parts of the U.S. economy are really in, in danger at this point? We got those numbers from Walmart. Walmart trading down substantially pre-market as a result of a, a warning. And, and this is customers having to, to cut back on their spending because of the cost of living. Is that something we're going to see a lot more of? We are going to see more of that, and I think this week is a big one in terms of earnings um, coming out. We have just close to half of the S&P companies reporting earnings. I think the forward guidance is going to be key, but also equity markets had repriced some of that risk. Um, so I'd say there is potentially further downside as we get more guidance lower in terms of consumer spending, um, expectations on hiring from corporates, but m the vast majority of the sell-off might actually be behind us. Mm. And where do we stand on the European story then? Let's pivot over to Europe because gas is clearly front and centre. We have uh, the, the, the energy ministers meeting today to try and forge some kind of European unified position on this, but that looks like a big test. Yes, indeed it is. And I think Europe, out of the developed economies, is probably the one that faces the highest degree of uncertainty. Whether you're looking at the gas story, and that's still evolving, we've seen more cuts on gas supplies being announced yesterday, when markets had just started to get a bit more comfortable with the gas story. I think that's going to remain a headwind uh, for markets to be able to calibrate where European policy needs to be. But then additionally, you have different stories playing out in different economies. You have uh, political uncertainty in Italy once again from and center. Um, so I'd say the outlook for Europe is actually a lot more challenging um, mm. than the outlook for the US. Yes, and so do you invest and trade around the idea that we are already in a recession in parts of Europe? The data certainly supports that in Europe. Um, and actually, if you know, when people talk about soft landing versus hard landing, depending on how things play out with the gas narrative in Europe, we might potentially be having discussions around a hard landing next year. Um, and I think that's probably the narrative that's going to be dominating the market from a European perspective for the next few months. Mm. So where is the bottom for risk assets then, do you think, uh, Diana, if, if we're still going to be talking about this for the next few months? Yeah, it depends on what risk assets you're looking at. So I'd say for fixed income markets, we probably have a high degree of premium embedded um, across a number of sectors. Um, we're not necessarily focused in the high yield space because if indeed we do see a growth slowdown materialize, um, you might see more stress coming into the high yield space. I think in the better quality part, so in investment grade uh, credit, there might be opportunities. Um, I think in sovereign bonds, particularly local sovereign bonds, and this is not just in developed markets, I'd say even in emerging markets, mm. we're starting to see some value um, in the back end of curves. Again, it's very much in line with the narrative that EM central banks have hiked a high, a high degree. They're yes. well ahead of the curve relative to developed markets. And so there is premium. Uh, 
um, in the back end of the curves, especially if you start to worry about recessions. How responsive do you think uh, corporate debt will be to, to rising interest rates? We've already seen interest rates rise a lot, of course, already. I asked this because one of my guests yesterday was saying, actually, uh, because a lot of companies have taken the opportunity with very low interest rates for such a long time to refinance over long periods, uh, that they're not actually going to be, even as rates rise, it'll take a long time for that sort of higher rate environment to filter through into the corporate space. Well, I would argue that corporate debt has already been fairly responsive. You're seeing spreads already quite wide across the whole spectrum of uh, corporate markets. And that's warranted. Precisely. So I would say corporate markets ha have been responding well to this. I'd say the next leg is less likely to be about um, rising interest rates and more about uh, rising credit risks as the economy slow down. Okay, Diana, really nice to see you. Thank you so much for coming in. Uh, good to speak to you. Diana Ramoa, CIO at Kirkuswold Asset Management with me here on set in London. Let's get a Bloomberg First Word News update. So with that, here's Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Anna. Russia's once again reducing the flow of pipe gas to Germany. Gazprom said it will cut shipments via the Nord Stream pipeline on Wednesday morning to about 20% of capacity, blaming maintenance issues. It says only one of six major turbines remains in working condition. Now, Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak have attacked each other's plans for the UK economy in their first head-to-head -head debate of the campaign to replace Boris Johnson as the Prime Minister, former Chancellor Sunak claimed his opponent's tax cuts would push up inflation. Foreign Secretary Liz Truss rebutted that, saying Sunak would drive the economy into recession. So your proposals would mean that we get the short-term sugar rush of unfunded borrowed tax cuts, but that would be followed by the crash of the higher highest... prices and higher mortgage rates. Everybody thinks that putting up taxes at this moment is going to hurt the economy. You can't put up taxes and get growth. Cool. If we follow Rishi's plans, we, we are headed Sophie, for a recession. Really get... Now, Coinbase Global is said to be facing a U.S. investigation into whether it improperly let Americans trade digital assets that should have been registered as securities. Sources say the SEC has increased scrutiny of Coinbase since the platform expanded the number of tokens it does offer. SEC Chair Gary Gensler has previously said trading platforms should do more to protect retail investors. And Alibaba is planning a primary listing in Hong Kong by year end as it seeks exposure to Chinese investors through exchange links at, with Shanghai and Shenzhen. That could boost liquidity after a year-long sell-off triggered by China's economic slowdown and Beijing's crackdown on its most powerful internet firms. Alibaba has shed some two-thirds of its value since a 2020 peak. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts and more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerens. This is Bloomberg. Anna. Leanne, thanks very much. Yeah, Alibaba shares up on their US listing in pre-market this morning. Coming up here on this program, Europe still faces a daunting challenge in the event of a cold winter. We discuss the latest on the gas crisis. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards, in for Francine Lacroix in London. Russia is once again sharply reducing the flow of gas to Germany, reminding Europe of the daunting challenge the continent faces to build up its energy stockpiles before winter. Meanwhile, the EU countries are set to tussle over an emergency regulation that could force 15% cuts in gas consumption during the colder months. I do expect that today we will have some... Interesting political discussions because member states do have different circumstances, different um, starting positions, but I do expect that in the end of the day we do have a political agreement. 
That was the EU Energy Minister hopeful of a political agreement, Kadri Simpson. Energy ministers are meeting in Brussels this morning. For more, let's bring in Bloomberg's uh, Lyubov Pronina, who is in Brussels. Uh, Lyubov, uh, it seems like a, a big ask to get all the European countries on one page. How significant is Gazprom's announcement to cut? Let's start there, because we were already at 40% of the usual flows. Now we're going down to 20 tomorrow. Uh, yes, in, indeed, it's um, uh, very important and, uh, shall we say, today's uh, emergency um, uh, meeting by energy minister ministers is uh, very timely uh, because uh, it's, it's happening that uh, Russia has been reducing flows uh, of its gas uh, to Europe this year. And uh, this has led the European Union uh, to taking steps, uh, getting uh, supplies uh, internationally. Mm. But uh, today, uh, the focus is mainly on what can be done domestically in the countries themselves, and that's reducing yes. demand for gas. Yes, and is it going to be possible, Lyubov, to, to craft a common position? There are so many variables here, and this is going to get quite tense, perhaps, just briefly. Uh, very true, and you have uh, showed an interview with um, uh, Energy Commissioner saying exactly that, that there are different positions, but still they're hoping uh, to reach an agreement by the end of the year, at least a political agreement, uh, because it simply is very, very urgent. And uh, there will be different things that will be brought by different member states uh, mm. to the table okay. today. Okay. And so we see if we get to a common position. Thanks so much, Bloomberg's Lyubov Pronina. Thanks for the update. Coming up, we'll be joined by the CEO of Dufri, the world's biggest duty-free group, for an exclusive conversation on the acquisition of the highway restaurant operator Autogrill. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here are your top stories. Outflows mount. UBS shares sink in early trade after reporting weaker than expected profit as the global sell-off sees investors pull money. Price bump. Unilever sees a second quarter beat but forecasts a, quote, unprecedented inflation surge and plans to raise prices. Shares start the day higher. Energy standoff. Russia's Gazprom curbs gas flows through Nord Stream as the EU drops up plans to reduce consumption. Good morning and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards, in for Francine Lacroix here in London. Let's get to one big corporate story this morning. The Swiss duty-free shopping group Dufri is set to acquire the Italian highway restaurant operator Autogrill, creating the, wor the world's largest travel stores operator. The sale of the, of the billionaire Benetton family's 50.3% stake in Autogrill to Dufri will form a $6 billion player in the travel retail market. The combined group boasts 5,500 outlets at around 1,200 airports and highways. A lot of numbers. Let's talk to the CEO of Dufri right now. That is Xavier Rossignol, who joins us on, uh, uh, on camera from Madrid. Uh, Xavier, thank you so much for joining us in, for this exclusive conversation. What is the primary aim of the deal around Autogrill? Where do you expect it to bring the biggest benefits? Good morning. Thank you for having me. Um, the big benefit will be our new focus on travel experience. We will have, as you said, 5,500 points of sales that will include from luxury shops, convenience stores, and also F&B outlets. We will be able to serve the traveler in any of the needs or wishes they have when they travel. Okay, so that's the big, that's the big uh, benefit. Where do you see, do you see synergies coming through from this, this deal? Of course, on top of that, we are going to have uh, cost synergies, but more importantly, revenue synergies. With the increased services we are going to provide, we are going to be able also to do hybrid concepts, where we are going to be able to combine premium luxury with uh, amazing gourmet uh, experience or convenience store with coffee stores. The whole point is the traveler has limited time during their journey and they want to maximize the value for that time. Also the combination will allow us to have access to 2.3 billion passengers every year, allowing us to do a revolution on the digital engagement with the travelers. We want mm. to be the choice of any traveler when they, they are in an airport. 
Okay, so, you, so you, you're suggesting this is a luxury and gourmet experience. Xavier, anybody I speak to who's travelled recently doesn't describe travelling post-COVID as a very luxury experience. It feels anything but. How do you make sure that your, the experience you deliver can be a positive one when th this is such a disrupted industry right now? Absolutely. I mean, the current situation of the airports is far from ideal. Uh, for our business, the best is that travelers are calm and they have a nice uh, situation to spend time in our shops and, and future restaurants. Said that, our sales on the first half of the year in many regions were already ahead of 2019. We see travelers really, really hungry for any type of experience. The situation is not ideal now, but I'm sure it will improve over the incoming months. Are travellers that are delayed, Xavier, are they proving to you that they're willing to spend? Are they, are they stuck in airports and therefore spending more? Some additional time, if you are not worried if your flight is going to be cancelled or not, is good because people have more time to spend money. But if there is really a massive chaos, that is not good for our business. So we want a, a right balance, that people have enough time but is not massively stressed because of the situation. Mm. Back to the deal that you've done then, uh, Xavier. The Benetton family will still be a big shareholder in your combined company. How vocal a shareholder do you expect the family to be? So the Benetton family through their holding company, Edizione, will hold between 20 and 25 percent of the combined group. They are massive supporters of our strategy on travel experience. Uh, so they are here for the long term and we are very happy that they support the management and the strategy of the company. Okay, yeah, what's, what's the day-to-day -day working relationship like with them? How much, uh, how much input do they, do they have? They are a strategic shareholder, but we are still a public traded company. They will have representation in the board of directors. Let's remember this deal will only close beginning of next year. But through the board of directors, they will uh, support advice on the strategy of the company. On the day to day, like in any public traded company, the management and the board of directors will hold uh, the management of the company. Mm. Some analysts, Xavier, have talked about financing hurdles ahead for Dufresne. Uh, are there any concerns that this is a big deal and it might present some financing hurdles? We don't think so. Uh, number one, the deal allows us to deleverage because the combined entity will have a lower leverage than Dufresne standalone. And second, we have enough financial resources, resources as we are now to finance the full the full transaction. Let's remember that the first stage, the stake of the Benetton family, it's all going to be financed through issuing of new shares and therefore no, act, no need to access the financial markets. Uh, you, clearly the travel industry is in high demand right now, Xavier. Are you at all concerned that if we end up in a recession in Europe or other parts of the world that there will be reduced demand for travel? We, like any other company, we are not hedged on a potential recession. But we need to think that today, vast majorities of the planet are still far behind the levels of 2019. Asia Pacific, for example, is massively still behind, especially because of the Chinese influence. We are still say, seeing minus 80 percent. So even if there is a slowdown on the recovery, we think that 22, 23, and probably also 24 will see increase of passengers. We maybe don't reach 2019 numbers, but it's clearly that there will be growth compared to the previous uh, three years. So I don't want to be bullish, but the, definitely there will be an increase on the passengers and therefore on our sales. This deal obviously uh, takes you further into a number of global markets, Xavier, including the US, further expansion planned there. What expectations do you have for the US market? Um, the U.S. is very large market, 19% of the global number of passengers and has proven because of the weight of the domestic passengers to be extremely resilient. We have seen that over the last three years. This uh, deal we are announcing uh, two weeks ago is allowing us 
to massively increase in the U.S. Said that is part of our strategy to go and grow strongly in Asia Pacific going forward. It's still the largest market in our industry, 37%. Our presence in 2019 was a small, 8%. So we think Asia Pacific will also be a massive opportunity for us going forward. It will take a little bit longer. The US is immediate. Asia Pacific is two, three years from now, but definitely the two poles are uh, where we put our uh, strategy of future growth. Xavier, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Xavier Rossignol, the CEO of Dufree, thank you for spending time with us here on Bloomberg TV. Now, UBS second quarter earnings are in. Second quarter profit missed estimates as investors pulled money as a global equities as global equities sold off. Let's delve into the details of those figures. We're joined now from Zurich by Bloomberg's Manus Cranny, who's been on the road all week. It feels like a long week already. Is it only Tuesday, Manus? So uh, let's get to the UBS numbers. They've taken a hit this morning. How brutal has this past quarter been? I would call it grim. It's a very great British kind of description, even though I'm Irish. It's grim. And I would say it's grim and reflected in the transactions down, in the lending down, and in the size of the fee-generating assets that they've gathered, also looking pretty meagre. So the response in the equity market this morning has been to take the stock down by 5%. They call it deleveraging I call it de-risking, and I think herein lies the point. Yesterday, Julius Burr called a bottom to the deleveraging in Asia. I found Ralph Hammers today much more cautious. I would say much more measured in his assessment. He lays it out very clearly, Anna. The next couple of months are going to be critically important in terms of the geopolitics, in terms of the China rebasing and basing out, let's say, at a lower level. And, of course, what happens with Russia and the gas situation? Priority and crisis risk number one. Take a listen. The top concern for Europe is indeed uh, cutting off completely from the gas supplies uh, for a couple of reasons. First, it will increase gas prices. Secondly, it will render a couple of industries as very um, in inefficient, right? So they can't work at peak capacity, also increasing prices. Um, and with that, you know, um, generating uh, further uh, inflation, uh, making inflation stubborn, uh, which is the real danger, right? That inflation is here to stay. So the risk from inflation is very much there. Hawkish central banks also part of the narrative. And yet inherent in these numbers, Anna, are the bolstering fact that you've got rising interest rates. Goodness knows what these numbers might really look like if we weren't in a new regime of rising rates. Anna. Mm, yeah. Now, as you prepare to speak to other uh, big names from the banking sector, of course, Credit Suisse reporting tomorrow. What did Ralph Harmer say regarding recession yes. risk and job cuts? Other other big themes around banking at this point. Well, we delved into, you know, the, the American banks have set aside $5 billion less on the investment banking side to remunerate their staff. He's not freezing hiring and nor is he firing. They're going to be judicious and particularly targeted with where they are. They're still in expansion mode. I think that's important to take away here because when I catch up tomorrow with Gottstein, well, it's going to be very, very clear. They have not just a market headwind in Asia. They have a structural issue at that bank. And that is an issue of confidence, something that UBS doesn't have. So UBS not in a firing and not in an all-out freeze mode. Tomorrow will very much be about how do you restructure this bank to convince institutional shareholders to stay on board with you, Gottstein? But for today at UBS, a message to the staff, no freezing. And uh, he's not worried about the buyback being pushed back, as we saw in America, because of capricious regulation. Anna. Manus, thanks very much. Manus Granny in Zurich for us today on UBS Tomorrow Credit Suisse. Coming up here on this programme, Unilever raises its prices to battle the impact of rising inflation. We'll bring you more of our interview with the CEO, Alan Jope. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in for Francine Lacroix in London. Let's get your Bloomberg Business Flash. Leanne Gerrans has a rundown for you. Leanne.
Hi, Anna. Barclays will start to buy back as much as $17.6 billion of securities after an admin blunder that saw it accidentally sell more structured and exchange-traded notes than were registered with the U.S. regulator. The six-week repurchase period, which starts from the 1st of August, should determine total losses from the error. Barclays has already put aside more than £500 million. Pounds. Now, Walmart has tumbled in late trading after a surprise cut to its profit outlook for the second time this year, citing the need for lower prices to clear bloated inventories. The U.S. retail giant says adjusted earnings per share will fall as much as 13 percent in the current fiscal year. It says consumers are shifting to spending on necessities, which is now hitting margins. And EasyJet says disruption to travel from staff shortages, soaring demand and caps on airport capacity forced it to take a 100 33 million pound charge in the latest quarter the uk based low cost carrier reported third quarter revenue ahead of estimates it says it still managed to operate 95% of its planned schedule in just 3 months to june and that's your bloomberg business flash anna Leanne, thanks very much. Leanne Gerrans with your business flash. Sticking with corporate news flow, Unilever says it's still pushing up prices as it faces the biggest cost surge in decades with inflation hitting many of its key markets. Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden has been speaking to the CEO, Alan Job. We have had a good first half. Uh, builds on the momentum that we saw in 2021. It has been pricing led, but with better than expected volumes. Uh, at the same time, our operating profits are up 200 million euros. I think more importantly for us, uh, the performance has been driven by our strategic priorities. Our big brands grew 10 percent. Uh, our priority markets, the U.S. and India, grew very well. China suppressed a bit by the COVID lockdowns, but competitiveness for us strong there. E-commerce growing well. And our new businesses, uh, Prestige Beauty and Health and Wellbeing, those are both, both growing well. Now, you're right, we are still in a period of sustained inflation. Uh, and so quality growth remains our top priority, driven by disciplined execution and the strategic choices that I, I just outlined. We're very conscious that the consumer is feeling the pinch in many parts of the world. And it is a very different picture in different parts of the world. Mm. And so how long do you expect inflation to last both in the UK and worldwide? Well, I think it's a dangerous business to predict the future at the moment, uh, but we certainly see peak inflation coming sometime in the second half. Uh, we're not there yet. And so uh, I think uh, we'll expect that sometime probably towards the end of Q3, beginning of Q4, we'll start to see the, the full flow through of commodity prices into uh, retail prices in the market. And you say you expect to improve margin in 2023 and 2024, but in a cost of living crisis, isn't it your duty to prioritise consumers over shareholders at this moment? Yeah, that's certainly true. In fact, we've only passed along about 70% of the input costs that we have felt through to retail pricing. And we have guided the market that our margins, our percentage margins, will be down this year. So we're certainly going to spread out the cost of uh, increases that we're seeing um, over a couple of years. And we um, are doing everything in our power to find savings and efficiencies and make sure that uh, the pressure that is brought to the consumer is the minimum possible one. Alan Jope there, the CEO of Unilever, saying they're prioritising consumers. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden, who you saw there speaking to Alan, uh, uh, to take us through some of the other key takeaways from that conversation. Lizzie, good morning. I mean, I mean he said volumes held up pretty well. They did seem to be a little lighter than, than the estimate, but then pricing was so good, so they were able to increase their sales guidance. Well, as one colleague elegantly put it earlier, Unilever has one lever, and it's pricing. <laughs> uh, well, Alan Jope is saying that uh, Unilever is passing on the price increases. That'll continue as he sees inflation peaking in the second half. And so you have to ask, when, you, when he's saying that uh, Unilever is prioritising the consumer over the shareholder, should you, should you raise an eyebrow at that? Uh, you know, this is a dangerous moment, though, for Unilever, because it's a moment where 
consumers who are trying to penny pinch in every way they can could flock to the discount retailers like Aldi and Lidl and abandon the brands they know and love from Unilever and never come back uh, to them. So that's why Alan Jope later in the interview said that they're being surgical about their prices, going for good, better and best to keep the options open for consumers. And whether it's convinced, is it convincing for markets? It does seem so. The last mm. time I checked at my desk, uh, Unilever was leading the footsie. Yeah, up by 2.9% this morning. So clearly uh, the market likes something it sees there. Lizzie, thank you very much. Thanks for the updates and bringing us that interview, Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden. Coming up on this programme, Alibaba seeks a primary listing in Hong Kong, paving the way for investors in China to directly buy shares in the e-commerce giant. That story is next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London, in for Francine Lacroix this morning. Now, Alibaba will seek a primary listing in Hong Kong, paving the way for investors in China to directly buy shares of the country's most prominent e-commerce company for the first time. Joining us to uh, think about that and to uh, indeed to preview what's going on in the tech sector right now, Matthew Bloxham, tech analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence, is with us. Uh, Matthew, very nice to have you with us. Um, are we going to see many other Chinese companies doing the same? Because years ago, there was a big flurry of excitement as all these Chinese big names wanted to list in New York. Now the geopolitics is such that perhaps they're less keen. Yeah, I think that's the key point. I was looking earlier and something like 260 Chinese companies are listed in the US. Mm. Well, it's a mixture of prime and secondary. Um, I, th I think this tension, essentially, the US is looking for more audit data. China wants to hold back on the data these companies are providing to the US. So I think it's inevitably going to create more uh, movement towards a primary listing in Hong Kong. Uh, JD.com, uh, Baidu being mentioned today uh, as other big tech companies that may well follow suit. And there's been a few other smaller names that have already done so in the last few months. I think it's a trend we're going to see mm. uh, grow through the course of this year and next And month. they already have, of course, secondary listings in yep. Hong Kong, don't they? But this will taps them more into the Chinese, the, the Stock Connect That's right. and things. The, the Stock Connect, yeah. yeah. So it opens up a huge you know, pool of liquidity essentially for them. So, you know, may help to these okay. share prices recover over time. Pivoting to US tech, mm. um, Alphabet reports later today. We've had results from Snap. We've had, and that raised warning signs about yep. ad revenue, didn't it? it Certainly did. on digital platforms. What what are you looking for? Yeah, and also Twitter too. So I think I think the question for our investors is whether the snap and Twitter weakness for the last week is company specific uh, or uh, evidence of a, a wider uh, set of headwinds on advertising revenue. I think most people expect ad revenue to slow. I think agency revenue in the last the, the second quarter has actually held up pretty well. Mm, yes, we saw um, that it was one of the U.S. companies, didn't we? Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, we did. So it's quite a confusing picture about mm. what's actually really going on in the ad market. So I think Google's probably going to hold up better. I mean, they just still generate 70, 80 percent of their revenue from ads. Um, I think there are some sense that some of the changes in privacy with Apple we've seen actually might help them a bit. But investors still expecting um, uh, growth to slow by about half, so to 11% from 20%, so big slowdown, but still growing a lot quicker okay. than Snap and Twitter. We're also watching for Google and Microsoft, of course, this week. Thank you very much, Matthew. Thanks for joining us. Matt Bloxham, technology analyst with Bloomberg Intelligence. More from Matt uh, coming up in later programming. Let's just get a few lines on what's going on in the markets right now. We have gas prices on the move higher this morning. So this is the European uh, gas benchmark, up by 6.8%. This does move around a lot, but this is in, in uh, as a result, really, of the news flow we've seen, which, uh, which told us that the Russians are going to dial back the supply of gas from Russia into Germany down to 20% of normal flows. That's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, it's at 40% right now. So we know that there are issues, that, or at least the Russians say there are issues around turbines. The Germans dismiss that explanation. Quick look at the markets then. European equity markets making, uh, well, not making much ground, but making very modest gains up by two tenths of 1%. UBS is uh, falling but uh, down by 5.7 percent unilever moves higher easyjet moves higher both all three of those in fact reporting numbers early edition continues next this is bloomberg you can argue about whether or not it's a recession technically or whether or not it's a slowdown, but it's definitely a loss of momentum. The market is waiting to see, um, you know, clear signs of a recession. I mean, the signs are powerful, but not 
definitive yet. I think it's a mild recession at, at best. I think it's uh, a mid-cycle slowdown. The trigger for the financial distress <laughs> is going to be a recession, and recession is not mild, shallow, but it's going to be severe and protracted. The consumer is at a very good starting point to weather whatever this economic storm ends up being called. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller, and Kaylee Lines. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. Walmart rocks the market. The giant retailer cuts its profit outlook for the second time. This warning comes as we get a deluge of earnings globally this week from Alphabet and Microsoft, kicking off the big tech parade today. UBS comes up short. The Swiss bank misses estimates as investors feel the global market slump. And U.S. regulators have questions for Coinbase. They're investigating whether the platform let investors trade digital assets that should have been registered as securities. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines in New York. And we're waiting, waiting, it seems, on European markets today. Kaylee, we've had plenty of inputs in terms of corporate news flow. Shocked a little by the Walmart numbers, certainly even here in Europe and waiting for the Fed. Yep, have to continue to digest all the earnings and warnings that are flowing out there. And, of course, waiting for monetary policy decisions coming up tomorrow as well, Anna. Now, in Asia overnight, I would note that it was a mostly up day. Modest gains uh, in large part. The MSCI Asia Pacific index was up about three three tenths of one percent or so but really the outperformance came from Hong Kong and specifically technology stocks in Hong Kong a move led by Alibaba on news overnight that it's seeking a primary listing in Hong Kong which would essentially allow Chinese buyers to directly purchase the stock for the first time so that gave a big lift to those shares up the better part of five percent in the Asian session now of course in China we also are continuing to pay attention to the deterioration in the property sector but we have seen pledges of support for it coming uh, from Chinese regulators and that actually giving a nice lift to iron ore maybe the demand picture looking a little bit brighter those features up five and a half percent overnight to just around hundred and twelve dollars a ton finally in foreign exchange I would note far and away your outperformer today is the Philippine peso actually heading for its biggest day of gains against the US dollar going all the way back to 2014 and that is after the country's central bank governor pushed back on the idea of mm. a pause at its August hike uh, meeting saying it could hike 25 or 50 basis points Matt. better cancel my trip to Manila this weekend. Take a look at what's going on here in terms of futures. We're off just about a quarter of a percent, but after the Walmart story last night, you'd think we'd be off more. Um, let's see what happens in just about four hours time when we open up. The 10-year yield coming down as investors buy that debt possibly concerned, well, definitely concerned about a recession, at least in some part. 277.40 is the level we're seeing on the 10-year right now. So we're headed back down. NYMEX crude headed back up, 204. So that doesn't look like re recession concerns. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't be uh, looking at more demand for oil. 98.78 is the Texas Intermediate price, and Brent, of course, is over $100. Bitcoin finally down about 5%, tracking um, uh, risk assets at $21,084. Maybe we see a weaker open. What does Europe look like this morning, Anna? Yeah, a little bit mixed, actually. Fairly flat overall, Matt, but we do see that higher oil price that you've been talking about supporting the London market, which is why we've got London outperforming, the FTSE 100 moving higher as the Zetradax and other markets in uh, continental Europe move lower today. Gas is a big talking point today. We've got the gas price at the highest level. This is the European benchmark, the highest level since March the 9th. Focus in minds once again on what's happening with flows or what is not flowing. Uh, we have had this warning from Gazprom then. They're going to cut back flows down to 20% of what is usual. We're we were already at 40% today. So tomorrow they cut back to 20% of normal flows. The Russians blaming uh, the, the turbine maintenance that needs to take place. The, the Germans not buying those arguments. And we see energy ministers meeting in Europe today to try and craft some kind of common view, which might be difficult to get to. I've also been focused on some other uh, share price movements. We've got UBS very much in focus for you. You can see UBS share price down by 5.7%. Uh, this is the company reports outflows in the United States and the profits come in weaker than expected. Unilever has pricing power, though, up by 2. 7% as yes the volumes came in a little lighter than were estimated in the most recent quarter but pricing was positive and they were able to pass those on so at least in the short term uh, they're able to guide higher on that front we've got Linton Sprungley that's what that very long name <laughs> is often shortened to and that's the last stock I've got for you this is a Swiss chocolate maker Kaylee and the stock is up by 4.2% the numbers pleasing the market thriving on inflation was the was uh, one of the lines used by one analyst to describe how chocolate companies are dealing with price pressures right now.
Yeah, I guess everybody's always willing to pay up for their chocolate, Anna. So definitely a lot of company stories to keep track of today, and we'll have more on a bunch of them in just a moment. But first, let's get a look at what is ahead today. Former U.S. President Donald Trump will be speaking at the America First Policy Institute Summit in Washington, D.C. at 3 p.m. New York time. The IMF also will be releasing its World Economic Outlook update. How much do those inflation forecasts go up and growth forecasts go down? Then tech earnings continue with Microsoft and Alphabet reporting. Plus, this one is for Matt Miller, General Miller. General Motors will be reporting at 6 a.m. New York Times, so less than an hour from now. And finally, we'll get some U.S. economic data, including new home sales and consumer confidence, Matt. Definitely looking forward to that GM um, release, as well as all of the earnings that we're seeing. Unilever says it's still pushing up prices as uh, it faces the biggest cost surge in decades. Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden spoke to the CEO, Alan Jope, this morning. We certainly see peak inflation coming sometime in the second half. Uh, we're not there yet, and so uh, I think uh, we'll expect that sometime probably towards the end of Q3, beginning of Q4, we'll start to see the, the full flow through of commodity prices into uh, retail prices in the market. Meanwhile, Walmart showed how inflation is hurting demand by cutting its profit outlook again in a surprise warning weeks ahead of its earnings report. Really the shock of yesterday. Let's get more with Kriti Gupta, Bloomberg Markets correspondent. So uh, big deal. Again, Walmart disappointing. It's a massive deal. I mean, think about their slogan here. It's their everyday low prices, their price match guarantee. In times of recession, you basically cut back on kind of the money you spend. You go to Walmart, you buy the generic goods. That makes it really hard for a company like Walmart to pass on their costs. And you can see that uh, in some of their num numbers here. They cut their earnings guidance for their second quarter and for the full year of 2023. In fact, their full year guidance, I think, is crucial. They cut it by 11 to 13 percent. Their previous forecast was a drop of only 1 percent. So you can see that was a tenfold increase. Huge when it comes to that. They also talked about that FX had when the strong dollar hurting them to the tune about $1.8 billion. And they are going to report those full second quarter results on August 16th. But we're going to keep an eye on that. But at the end, of the day it's the question of this is the lowest income bracket they're dealing with inflation the worst and they just can't handle those higher costs so therefore they're going to cut back on their spending and that's going to hit walmart's bottom line well especially on bigger ticket items like electronics so now walmart's going to have an inventory issues on their hands same warning we've gotten from target you mentioned those fx headwinds though creating especially for these big multinational companies that are operating in places like europe you have the growth slowdown on the one hand, then the foreign exchange headwind coming back the other way. That's not going to be good for the likes of McDonald's or Coca-Cola. Yeah, you know, it's funny that you mentioned McDonald's because The Economist is just relaunching their Big Mac index, I think, like in the, <laughs> la in the last couple of days. So it's huge. It's very timely uh, because you do have McDonald's earnings coming this morning. 66% of their revenue comes from abroad. Same story with Coca-Cola. Uh, and this is going to be huge when we talk about bringing those profits back to the United States um, and also just how much the consumer is willing to pay around. Remember, once again, these are, these are small ticket items. This is the opposite of the Walmart story where they're looking for a happy meal for example and still that's still going to hit them they can't really have those price increases because once again their demographic is much much lower income Okay, Chrissy, thanks very much. Bloomberg's Chrissy Gupta with an update on some uh, uh, companies that have given us uh, uh, their, their, their numbers or their guidance and some that are still to come. Now, in tech news, Alibaba will seek a primary listing in Hong Kong. This paves the way for investors in China to directly buy shares of the country's most prominent e-commerce company for the first time. Meanwhile, tech earnings get underway with Alphabet and Microsoft reporting later today. Joining us now on what to expect is Matthew Bloxham, tech analyst with Bloomberg Intelligence. Matthew, what are you looking ahead to then today when it comes to that big tech picture yes obviously with Google it's really all about the ad revenue outlook um, there are headwinds from uh, uh, advertisers spending less money uh, the money they are spending they're spending more of it with TikTok um, so there are pressures there to some degree Google might get some tailwind from the ad tracking shifts with Apple that might take some more of that spend towards them but all that in, in total means that probably they're going to see about 11% growth in ad revenue. That's down from about 20% last quarter. It's a really big slowdown mm. uh, that people are expecting. So, you know, the market's primed for a kind of a, a gloomier picture, but still, still decent growth. Obviously, cloud is really important to Google. It's a loss-making business right now, but it's growing very strongly. Historically, 40 45% growth this quarter, probably slowing to the low to mid-30s. Maybe if that growth slows again, perhaps people look for them to get to profitability on that business quicker than, than they're currently expecting. All right, Matt, thanks so much for joining us. Matthew Bloxham there from Bloomberg Intelligence. We'll get more tech analysis later this hour from Sarah Simon, a senior analyst at Berenberg, as we prepare for a deluge 
of tech earnings. Also, UBS uh, reported weaker than expected profit in the second quarter. The market sell-off kept the Swiss bank's wealthy clients on the sidelines and institutional investors withdrew funds as well. Bloomberg's Manus Cranny spoke with the CEO, Ralph Hammers, in Zurich earlier. The top concern for Europe is indeed uh, cutting off completely from the gas supplies uh, for a couple of reasons. First, it will increase gas prices. Secondly, it will render a couple of industries as very um, in inefficient, right? So they can't work at peak capacity, also increasing prices. Um, and with that, you know, um, generating uh, further uh, inflation, uh, making inflation stubborn, uh, which is the real danger, right? That inflation is here to stay. Manis joins us now from Zurich to tell us um, what really hit from that interview. Manis? Matt, I think it is the market is just not convinced that we've hit any kind of a base in terms of deleveraging. I mean, the words that UBS used was it, it was a muted quarter. I would say it was brutal. Transaction on the wealth management, the bulwark of this uh, private wealth manager, down 17%. Net new fee generating fees in the bucket, barely up 0.4 billion and lending down. Yes, the money flowed out in the U.S. because you've got to pay your taxes. But this market remains unconvinced that we've hit a base in Asia. Deleveraging for the fourth straight quarter. Yes, money flowed into Asia, but there is still not that huge engagement that you need from the wealth management. Yes, it's about preserving your wealth, but it's about preparedness to act. Interest rates have helped. And Hammers pointed out that those hawkish central banks were something that would play into his numbers. But the takeaway here, Raul, the takeaway here is that asset management crumbled, but so did the whole world deleverage. The question now is the next two quarters, according to Hammers, will be the definitive quarters in terms of deciding a turning point in these markets, China and leverage. All right. Well, we will look ahead to those then. Banis Craney reporting from Zurich. Thank you so much. Now, Bloomberg has learned that Coinbase is facing a U.S. investigation on cryptocurrency listings. This move comes as a chorus of U.S. regulators to do more to oversee the crypto industry has grown louder. Joe Matthew, Bloomberg Washington correspondent, joins us now with the latest from D.C. So, Joe, it seems like we talk a lot about regulatory scrutiny of cryptocurrencies, and yet we yeah. have yet to see real tangible regulation in large part. Yeah, it's been on a real simmer here, and Coinbase, by the way, says it did nothing wrong, uh, Kaylee, that it's confident its diligence process, which it points out in a statement has been reviewed by the SEC, is in fact designed to keep securities off the exchange. But of course, we have three sources telling Bloomberg that the SEC is in fact probing the company, and it's been looking more closely at Coinbase since the company began increasing the number of tokens that it trades. For our listeners and viewers who do not trade crypto and may not see the crypto show with you and Matt Miller, uh, they, be aware Coinbase trades a lot more than Bitcoin. They, in fact, more than 150 different tokens are traded. And they're asking the SEC for clarity around the rules, even as they make clear that they don't think they did anything wrong here. If they were found to have traded securities, then the company may well have to file register with the SEC as an exchange. Mm, Joe, uh, of course, everybody watches the crypto show on Bloomberg TV Tuesdays, I think. I'm sure someone will mention the exact timing <laughs> for you later. Now, Donald Trump returns to Washington, uh, D.C., Joe, and is set to speak at 3 p.m. Eastern time. Yeah. What should we expect to hear from the former president? Well, probably a lot more of the same. He's been working on the stump speech for, uh, for the past couple of months here, and we typically get... You know, kind of the same uh, act here that, that you would expect from Donald Trump. There was some thought that maybe he would announce a, a run for president, a third term, but that's not expected to happen today because it would trigger a lot of fundraising rules. It would trigger federal election laws uh, that would make his life a little bit more difficult when it comes to raising money. But this is his first uh, speech back here in the Capitol, his first visit to the Capitol since leaving the White House. I have to be honest, we were more curious about what Mike Pence was going to say in a scheduled speech mm. last night. They were supposed to be back to back essentially with Mike Pence at the Heritage Foundation, but because of severe weather here in D.C., they had to turn the plane around. He never made it. Hmm. Yeah, we got some severe weather here in New York as well yesterday. Bloomberg's Joe Matthew, thank you so much. And of course, you can listen to Joe every weekday on his radio program, Sound On. That's at 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Bloomberg Radio.
Now let's get back to the markets and take a look at some stocks moving in pre-market trading here in the U.S. Joe was just running us through that Coinbase SEC story. And of course, in tandem with the declines we are seeing in Bitcoin itself, we're seeing Coinbase under some serious pressure in early hours right now down the better part of four percentage points. One more positive story out there is F5. That is a communications company. It delivered a better than expected quarter and better than expected outlook, working through some of the supply chain issues uh, that it is facing as a result. That stock up about 8%. But of course, the real story of the day is Walmart and the overhang that its second uh, outlook cut is having on really the entire retail sector. That includes its peers like Target, which already has delivered two outlook cuts of its own. Target is down about 4.5% before the bell, Leanna. Yeah, so the, uh, the, the the feeling from Walmart being felt everywhere in the U.S., here in Europe as well. We see it way on retail stocks. Coming up, we will talk about where the macro picture goes from here. Sarah Kewin, Chief Economist for Americas and Europe at Standard Chartered, joins us. We heard so many different takes on the R word, recession, the possibility of it, and where it will fall the hardest and for how long. At the top of the program, we'll put some questions to Sarah on that. And as Joe Matthew mentioned, don't miss Bloomberg Crypto today at 1 p.m. New York time, 6 p.m. in London, the weekly show co-hosted by Matt and Kate covers the people, transactions and technology shaping the world of decentralized finance. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. We are simulcast on both Bloomberg Radio and Bloomberg Television. I'm looking at a curve right now that Jay Powell said he was focused on. It's not the twos, tens inversion that the Fed chair cares about. It's the three-month, 18-month forward, three-month uh, yield uh, that he cares about. And what we're seeing at this point is getting closer and closer to the zero level after we had the Chicago uh, National Activity uh, Index coming down, also signaling a recession, adding to the Atlanta uh, index that signals we're in a recession. Simon White, Bloomberg macro strategist, joins us now to talk about, I guess, why we're not in a recession, Simon, since all these indicators are pointing to um, that we are. Well, I'd say when it comes to looking at one particular indicator um, to judge whether you're in a recession or not, you've got to be quite careful. I subscribe to Goodhart's law that when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to become a good measure. And everybody's now focusing on the yield curve again. But really, to judge whether you get a recession or not, it's a really broad-based suite of indicators you, you have to look at. So the yield curve on its own um, is useful, but it's a bit of a red herring. OK, and we seem to get uh, as many takes on recession as there are commentators right now, Simon, which is useful and not. And let me ask you about the broader role that bonds will play if we do go into a recession, because I know you've been looking at what an inflationary recession means for bond markets, which is not something we've experienced for a long time. Exactly. It's, it's a very good point. So we have seen yields come off lately um, because people think maybe the recession risk mm. is rising. So people are obviously working off the old playbook that it's a safe haven in times of recession. But in an inflationary recession, that isn't necessarily going to be the case. Um, and the three-month, 18-month uh, uh, curve that Matt just referred to, the reason why Powell uses that is because it gets rid of the term premium, which is the inflation compensation um, that you get with bonds. Now, that's still falling right now, which is kind of suggesting that the market is not pricing in any sort of inflation compensation that you might expect. Term premium in the 70s rolls all the way through the 70s. Mm. So it still seems that people are going for the old playbook that this is a regular recession and not an inflationary recession. So we need to find different havens, perhaps. Simon, thank you very much. Being back, Simon White with the latest on the markets. And for more market analysis, check out MLIV Go. That is the Markets Live blog on your Bloomberg terminal. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines with Matt Miller in New York and Anna Edwards in London. Now keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. The British economy was the focus in the first head-to-head -head debate between Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak. The two are battling to replace Boris Johnson as prime minister. Sunak claimed that Truss's planned tax cuts would increase inflation and interest rates. Truss said that Sunak's plans would drive the economy into recession. 
Russia is reminding Europe of the challenge it faces to build up energy stockpiles before winter. Gazprom is again sharply reducing the flow of natural gas to Germany. Shipments of the Nord Stream pipeline will be reduced to about 20 percent of capacity. The company blames maintenance issues. No word on how long the cut will remain in place. In China, the economic recovery gained momentum this month. Business activities resumed and confidence improved despite disruptions from COVID outbreaks across the country. That's the outlook based on Bloomberg's aggregate index of eight early indicators for this month. And House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's staff isn't ruling out plans for her visit to Taiwan next month. That trip has already stoked more tension between the U.S. and China. If it takes place, it would happen within days of an expected phone call between President Biden and China's Xi Jinping. Beijing has been warning Pelosi not to visit Taiwan, which it considers part of its territory. Coming up, we'll continue to weigh the economic picture, not just in China, but the U.S. and Europe, as well as we gear up for a Federal Reserve decision tomorrow. 75 basis points is what is expected, but of course they are hiking into data that is deteriorating as we think about the consumer and the impact of inflation, evidenced by Walmart's second outlook cut that we've gotten in the last 24 hours. We'll discuss it all with Sarah Hugh and Chief Economist for Americas and Europe at Standard Charter. That's coming up next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. Walmart rocks the market. The giant retailer cuts its profit outlook for the second time. This warning comes as we get a deluge of earnings globally this week from Alphabet and Microsoft kicking off the big tech parade today. UBS comes up short. The Swiss bank misses estimates as investors feel the global market slump. And U.S. regulators have questions for Coinbase. They're investigating whether the platform lets investors trade digital assets that should have been registered as securities. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines in New York. Uh, Matt, European equity markets finding it kind of heavy going, I suppose, in the run-up to the Fed. We've had a, a whole lot of uh, earnings numbers to digest here in Europe. How do U.S. futures look? Yeah, well, um, we're down, but only about three-tenths of 1%, which is interesting considering we got Walmart cutting its outlook again last night in a bit of a shock to the market. Maybe this bad news can turn out to be good news for Mr. Market if um, the Fed doesn't hit a super high terminal rate or turns around and starts cutting um, sooner than later. In any case, uh, it's interesting to see that futures aren't down more. Of course, we still have a solid uh, four hours to go until the market opens. Investors are buying 10-year debt. That pushes the yield down to 277.22 right now. Maybe that's recession concerns. But on the other hand, NYMEX crude is up 160 a barrel to 98.31. So it looks like there's still um, an outlook for gasoline demand. Bitcoin Bitcoin is down almost 5% right now at 21,122, and that is a highly correlated asset to risk uh, assets. So maybe we are going to see a bigger drop this morning. Kaylee, what do you see in terms of pre market movers? Well, really, it's all about Walmart this morning, Matt. You alluded to it the second guidance cut we have gotten from this company. They say profit could be down as much as 13% uh, for the full year. And of course, the problem is Walmart caters to a lower end consumer. And when that lower end consumer is forced to pay more for groceries and for gas, those discretionary general merchandise items aren't getting as much attention. Of course, that's the inventory Walmart had really built up over the course of the pandemic, trying to meet demand. Now that demand is going away and they have a lot of inventories that they have to work through, which means markdowns that weighs on profit. And that is all weighing on the stock this morning. Walmart down about 9% before the bell. And of course, that's weighing really on retail stocks across the board. If you look at the big underperformers in early hours, almost all of them are retail names of different types. Target is down almost 5%. TJX, which of course is a more discount retailer, down about 3 0.7% and even Amazon down about three and a quarter percent before the bell. So there's going to be a lot of pain in the retail sector today, Anna. Kaylee, European equity markets pretty flat this morning, torn in two directions really by divergent earnings pictures. Uh, we'll get some of these uh, earnings play, earnings names for you in just a moment. Some of the stocks on the move, the likes of UBS, the likes of Unilever. Uh, here we go. This is uh, the, the uh, 
No, not quite. Anyway, we've got some of the names in there that uh, that we that we should have. Uh, we've got the stocks Europe 600 then fairly flat this morning. The natural gas price moving higher here in Europe, up to levels we haven't seen since March the 9th. If we had UBS in there, you'd see that that share price really moving lower on the back of their earnings report. Uh, that was something that disappointed the markets, talking about outflows in the United States. And we've also had numbers out from Unilever, uh, where, where we did see more positive response. So Unilever moved a little bit higher on the back of their ability to pass prices on, pass price increases on to consumers and that has that stock there you go up by 2.2 percent we got there in the end matt got there in the end all right that's what matters um speaking of getting there at the end it looks like the chicago national activity index is pointing to a recession the latest leading indicator to give us bad news sarah hewan chief Econ uh, economist um, for the americas and europe at standard charter joins us now to talk about this sarah we saw already the, the atlanta now gdp tracker showing two consecutive quarters of contraction um do you think we're in a recession right now it's possible that we're in a technical recession. Our own view is that we'll see GDP positive for second quarter, but clearly uh, you could have a big gyration in inventories, which takes the reading negative. Mm. It seems as if a, a number of factors are still likely to be mild positives, and that's why we think that we'll avoid this technical recession. The question, though, is uh, what's happening to unemployment? So we had the second quarter ongoing jobs creation, the unemployment rate staying at a very low level. I think in, in real terms, that doesn't count as a recession. And the more pertinent point is, are all these current indicators suggesting that we are sliding into a much steeper and potentially more prolonged downturn either in the current quarter or in Q4, which is what we're expecting. Sarah, these days, um, all we ever talk about is real GDP. But if you look at nominal GDP, it's being brought up more often to counter the recession narrative. We're still looking at maybe double digit growth. Does that matter? I think we do need to look at what's happening to the real economy. Clearly, you've got uh, items like retail sales um, showing pretty strong growth year on year and even quarter on quarter. But in real terms, what people can buy in the supermarkets, in shops, is contracting. People's real incomes are being squeezed. They're continuing to have to draw on savings to um, make, make up the gap. And that can't sustain. Ultimately, it looks as if there's going to be a consumer-led downturn, and that may be uh, ongoing right now. OK, Sarah, uh, good morning to you. A consumer-led downturn, downturn. And then to Matt's point, does that kind, is that the kind of corporate report that might be big enough, might be indicative enough of, of pain in the US consumer, certainly at certain income levels? that it might actually influence what the Fed is thinking or is, you know, this just does not get in the way at all of the laser focus on inflation? It's very challenging, I think, to announce a 75 basis points rate hike, which I think is pretty much bedded in now, and at the same time to warn about recessions. So our view is that the Fed is going to continue to talk about inflation, inflation risks, and inflation indeed being the big number one concern, uh, bringing inflation down as the way to ensure that eco the economy can grow. And it's true that uh, the consumer squeeze is in the face of very, very high energy prices, very high food prices. Mm. Um, Fed has to try to rebalance demand and supply. Um, and I, I don't think tomorrow is going to be the right time for the for the for them to announce the pivot, essentially. Yes. OK, so that pivot, yeah, just too early. How quickly does the economy respond to the tightening that we're seeing at this point? And, Sarah, I spoke to one guest yesterday who was saying, actually, if it used to be six months, it's much longer now, this was her view, saying that uh, a lot of companies had taken the opportunity, companies and consumers had refinanced at lower rates during a long period of low interest rates. And so some of those are locked in, certainly on mortgages and in, on the corporate side as well. And so there was an argument, in her view, that actually it'll take a really long time for these hikes to filter through into the economy. Well, there's the challenge, because if we go back to previous recessions, then obviously there was a much more immediate impact in terms of corporate debt servicing costs, household debt servicing costs. This time around, uh, the households and co companies are protected to an extent for a while. Mm. The risk is that the hit comes much in a much bigger way when eventually they do need to refinance. Mm. Uh, but I think that uh, the there is an immediate impact in terms of expectations, and this is 
what the Fed is trying to do, raise interest rates, show that they're serious about inflation, make sure that inflation expectations remain well anchored. And we do have mm -hmm. positive signs of that. If we look at the University of Michigan inflation expectations reading, that's coming down. So mm. some success there. Okay. So, Sarah, this really highlights the difference between the Fed and the ECB because the Fed is trying to get demand down, and they're having some success doing that, which should match supply and demand, bring inflation down as a result. The ECB is fighting higher energy prices in large part, something that it has no ability to control, and that's evidenced by the news we got on the gas, flow, uh, gas prom flows to Germany down to 20 percent once again. Realistically, does the ECB hiking do anything for the European economy? It's the same story in effect. It's all about inflation expectations and this is what ECB policymakers have continued to talk about, that they are worried that in, uh, European wages are starting to pick up. We've had minimum wage increases. We've had wage settlements that are still within the realms of uh, uh, not, not too strong a, a push on, on prices, but that are have the potential to drive inflation somewhat higher next year. So again, it's sending the signal that they're not prepared to tolerate high inflation, but also uh, rebalancing supply and demand. Credit costs have risen already, so they're having an impact there. Mm -hmm. um, there is a, a, a risk, of course, that the uh, high gas prices that we're seeing will take the economy into recession later in the year. At the same time, we still only have the refi rate at 0.5% against inflation of over 8%. So real interest rates are still very, very sharply negative. Well, Sarah, to that point, if you think the Fed's going to get to 3% and then get stuck there, where is the ECB going to be able to hike to before getting stuck, given the incoming recession you're describing? Uh, good question. We think that they're aiming at 2%. Uh, now, they won't get there anytime soon, in our view, but uh, it's likely that they will get partway, partway there. We're looking for uh, two more 50 basis point hikes uh, by the end of this year to t take the referee rate up to 150, and then a pause, because we do think that the economy is going to be looking very weak by that stage. Uh, but if they're aiming for 2%, then there's still scope for further rate hikes in the spring and summer of next year. Um, it's a difficult game to play because, as we talked about earlier, the time lags involved suggest that the real impact of these rate hikes won't be felt until another 12 to 18 months, by which stage the economies could be in a very different situation. OK, yeah, and we see uh, gas prices moving higher here in Europe today. Sarah, up by 9.5%, underlining the challenges that the Eurozone economy faces. Sarah, thank you very much. Sarah Kewin joining us on set with the latest thoughts on the global economy. Coming up, online advertising losses, or loses, sorry, its luster. We will discuss the trouble in tech with Sarah Simon, a senior analyst at Berenberg. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, General Motors CFO Paul Jacobson. That's at 7.45 a.m. Eastern Time. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines with Matt Miller in New York and Anna Edwards in London. While Microsoft and Alphabet lead the tech earnings parade today after the bell, growth is sputtering across the sector with the pullback in online advertising grabbing investor attention. Research firm Magna estimates that the U.S. digital ad market increased just 11 percent in the second quarter. That's a steep deceleration from 58 percent growth in the same period a year ago. Joining us now to discuss is Sarah Simon, senior media analyst at at Berenberg. So, Sarah, of course, we already heard from Snap last week, warning of the slowdown in digital advertising spending. To what extent are Alphabet and Meta going to fall victim to those same headwinds, or is that mostly a Snap issue? I, I think it, it's kind of complicated, right? So, we know, obviously, that the economy is slowing. If you look at the data for June, you can see that even um, or total advertising actually declined. But there are some company-specific things going on with Snap and obviously with Twitter as well. Um, with Google, we think um, the search uh, functionality is, is right on the button in terms of the kind of advertising that people want now. So 
as the economy slows, we think the more vulnerable kinds of advertising will be brand advertising. It's harder to measure. Obviously, there's the whole uh, question of Apple and the privacy headwinds there. Um, the kind of advertising that you can measure with a direct response, like Google search, ought to be more defensive than, than traditional brand advertising. And that applies um, digitally and in the broader um, advertising market. So Sarah, obviously there's kind of two prongs to this issue. On the one hand, there's fewer advertising dollars maybe being spent, but there's also more places to spend them. How much of this is just competition effects and TikTok? There's definitely competition effects and TikTok is one of them, particularly in the context of Snap. But don't forget that there's other places for advertising dollars. Um, the obvious one here is Amazon, mm. uh, which has built a huge advertising business online with its retail media proposition. And that's an area uh, across the internet where we see a lot of dollars going as advertisers look for uh, places to put money which aren't dependent on third party identifiers like cookies, um, but also get closer to the consumer in terms of wanting to advertise actually where they're shopping. So there's market share shifts going on between companies, but also between types of digital media advertising. Yeah, I, I wonder which is more important. I mean, if you're a company that only has uh, so much budget, do you go with Google before you go with Facebook? Um, is Amazon, as you uh, suggest, increasingly become a contender? Is there one overarching ruler of this uh, online or social advertising uh, dollar? I don't think I don't think there's a one size fits all. It depends on on the strategy for the specific marketer. Um, but as I say, we do think that brand advertising is going to be more vulnerable than performance based advertising. That probably favors Google over Facebook. Um, but then you've got the privacy points as well. Uh, again, you know, Facebook's highlighted a pretty significant headwind there from um, from privacy uh, uh, to the tune of about $10 billion impact on sales this year. OK, so we've got all kinds of things playing in here. There are the different parts of the of the digital uh, advertising space, Sarah, as you've, as you've nicely laid out. There's the competitive movement around TikTok and other newer players and Amazon and the like. There's the Apple story. So have we started to see the macro headwinds weighing on advertising yet? Or is that still all to come? We're definitely seeing signs of it. Um, we're seeing it particularly in um, media where there is more structural pressure. Uh, so we've seen a big decline in linear TV ad dollars in June. Uh, in the US, we're seeing signs of softness in Europe. Um, the agencies say they're not really seeing anything yet. They've all, or three of the big four um, US uh, European players have actually raised guidance in the last couple of weeks. But uh, we definitely think there is more to come in terms of the downgrades. Obviously, there's a, a bit of, um, there are multiple moving parts here because you've got things like travel advertising recovering really, really strongly. And that's offsetting some of the underlying weakness in other sectors and a bit of a mm. battle between physical retail and online retail. So there's a lot of moving parts here, but we expect the advertising environment to worsen as we get through the year. OK, but that's interesting. So I was going to say, so how is it possible that we're seeing, you know, that the online, the digital stuff being uh, so hit and yet the, the big media houses that have reported, as you say, ha have painted quite a resilient picture? Are they just exposed to different parts of this? And for example, if you sell a lot of travel advertising, you're going to be doing OK still? Uh, I mean, yes, if you were specifically travel oriented, you would clearly be having a very good year. But um... No, I think it's partly a reflection of the fact that the agencies have diversified away from pure advertising. So they look different to what they did in the last um, downturn and the one before. Uh, so they're less directly skewed into it. They're also based, uh, their, their remuneration is based on fees rather than a share of spending. So there's, we think, a lag effect. Um, we think they'll be later cycle than the media owners. Um, so there's a couple of reasons okay. why they wouldn't be moving exactly in line with the actual media owners like the TV companies, the publishers, um, the digital players. OK, that's really interesting, Sarah. Thank you so much. Good to get your perspective. Sarah Simon, senior media analyst at Berenberg. Uh, talking of travel, let me get to some breaking news flow surrounding Lufthansa. And we bring you this because it's sort of indicative, perhaps, of a broader trend. Lufthansa to cancel most flights in Frankfurt and in Munich on Wednesday. So if you have travel plans that take in 
Germany. Bear that in mind. Uh, this is because of strike activity. Uh, the, the strikes will lead to calling off uh, flights to Frankfurt and to Munich. They say some disruptions may linger into the weekend. We'll continue to monitor. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines with Matt Miller in New York and Anna Edwards in London. And also joining us now, Tom Keen, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance, who is gearing up for the next three hours of programming. Tom, it's a day where we're focused a lot on individual companies. We've got Walmart here in the U.S. and abroad <coughs> in Europe, UBS, which I think captures uh, your attention for your single best chart today. Well, there's a lot to talk about. Without question, the single best chart, which you're going to do in a minute, is natural gas in Europe. It is jaw-dropping and it moves Euro weaker uh, right now. Now, there's actually some real tension to the tape uh, this morning. In the individual stock uh, area, what absolutely fascinates me is the managed message out of so many companies, both on the left side and the right side of the Atlantic, UBS, and that Manus Cranny conversation, managing the message forward. Well, the message is from 2007, EU banks are an absolute train wreck. This is UBS back a good 15, 20 years. Uh, I've set it up logarithmic so you see percent change. And it's just basically a red zone, green zone stock that can't grow its way to a higher uh, level. It gets back up to 20 uh, Swiss francs per share, I believe it is, and then it rolls over. This is set in dollars. What do you have in terms of, I know we're waiting for General Motors uh, earnings and you've got the CFO. What else are you looking at today? Well, we're looking, at the, we're looking at tech. We're diving into the big tech area and Walmart's not big tech, but Walmart was sobering on the changed behavior of consumers in America. That's a mystery right now. Just as one idea, Matt, Joe Feldman over at Dana Telsey uh, knocks Walmart down from a 160 price target to 145. It seems like everybody's readjusting to the new inflation weary consumer. All right, Tom Keen of Bloomberg Surveillance, thank you so much. We'll look forward to your coverage over the next couple of hours. Now, as for what else we're watching, Tom mentioned tech. That is what I will be focused on after the bell. We'll get results from both Microsoft and Alphabet. Of course, Microsoft, as usual, will be paying attention to the Azure cloud business. What kind of growth is it seeing? For Alphabet, carrying on the conversation we were just having uh, with Sarah Simon from Berenberg, it's going to be about advertising and how much online ads are slowing down in the face of a deteriorating macroeconomic uh, outlook. And of course, both of these companies in recent weeks have warned about slowing hiring or even laying people off um, in certain businesses. So I'm sure we'll get some color around that on the earnings calls as well, Matt. Yeah. And of course, we're, as I said, waiting for General Motors. I'm watching this to see how much of a problem it's going to be for the second quarter. Um, General Motors has said they've got a lot of vehicles on lots that they can't ship out because they don't have the chips to complete them, I think 95,000 um, was what they said in their uh, warning to the to the street. They did say um, they'll finish the vehicles by the end of the full year, which is good because they'll be able to hit their full year targets. We'll see if they repeat that today. Um, and obviously, there are a lot of people out there waiting for their Chevy Silverado 1500 ZR2s to be delivered as soon as possible. Please, thank you. <laughs> a lot of a lot of people, Matt. A lot of people, more than one, I'm sure. Uh, let me move to what I'm focused on here in Europe, and that is very much the EU Energy Ministers meeting. It takes place today, and it's very timely, of course. We see for a second day that European gas futures are rising more than 10%. I can see that that uh, Dutch benchmark now up by more than 10% uh, just in today's session, and it was up by 10% yesterday. We heard, of course, overnight from the Russians that they are going to cut back tomorrow on the flow of gas from 40% of the usual levels down to 20%. So that's the movement we're expecting tomorrow. The Energy Ministers are meeting. It's going to get really complicated complicated to try and bring the EU27 together on one common path ahead. The Germans want targets on cuts. The Greeks want compensation for cuts. It's going to get messy. We'll watch that political story out of Brussels. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>